I'm going to use this as a little bit of a, a learning moment, and that is when you come to a conference like this, be on time. Because speakers, whether they are busy or not busy, we think we're busy. So be on time. I was just a little concerned when we were waiting at the bus stop. So let me, uh, my name is Amy Mackey. I was at the University of Washington in Seattle for about 30 years. Retired from there, opened up my own company and work in the area of developing human capital. You all. And I was born in Cleveland, Ohio, raised in a predominantly African-American community, moved to Seattle and discovered I was Asian. <laughs> and it was a rude awakening. <laughs> so some of the things I'm going to say and present to you, I don't want you to take a front like, well, is she trying to, what is she trying to do? You know, it is me and it really is. And I also have a degree in Spanish. So, um, and I was telling students before when I uh, taught the multicultural ed class at the University of Washington, I presented the first minute of my course in Spanish, at which point <laughs> A student went out of the room because he was in the, thought he was in the wrong class. But I was trying to set a tone of feeling that you could say anything you wanted in the class, you would feel comfortable, but there are some assumptions we all make when we first meet somebody, correct? First, is, first impressions. This session is about communication. We're going to go over a quick introductions, why we're here, what I hope you gain from it, and then do some practicing. I hope you all brought pencil and paper with you since we provided that. And then you will be called on to come up front and participate in a few activities. So, and those who sat in the back, be prepared because you didn't come up forward, so I'm going to call on you. But here, um, what are, we're going to talk about today, the importance of communication. There are a lot of things we take for granted when we're speaking, whether it's our tone, our pace. And so we'd like to talk about the nonverbal communication cues that we use. We're going to also begin a personal statement for applying to graduate school. If we don't get to that or you need additional help, you have my email. You want to send me a rough draft? Subject title in the email. Let me know that you're from MATC and you have a personal statement. I will be more than happy to review it for you, okay? So what I hope will come of this is that you'll gain a better knowledge of what communication is how to use it to your benefit, both written and verbal communication. We're going to start with just general terminology. What's the philosophy? What's the psychology behind communication? What are the components of verbal and written communication? And then, again, we're going to do some practice of uh, actually beginning to do that. I'm going to go back here. So what is communication? Tell me, what, it, what is it? What, am I try what are we doing in communication? Sharing. Sharing. Teamwork. Team it, conveying a message. Expressing ideas. Expressing ideas. So we're trying to express, get communicated, get an idea to one another. How do we do it? Talking. Verbal. Talking. Writing. Writing. Body language. Body language. What else do you do all the time? I mean, okay. text. Email. <laughs> email. And those are great methods. Texting, emailing, uh, phone conversations. More, I want to more focus on the texting and the um, emails. A lot of us use that daily, but what it doesn't give you is 
the nonverbal communication skills that you'll need, one, when you take an interview to go to grad school, two, when you go for a job, although a lot of companies now interview by Skype and other methods, you still are going to have to learn about that face-to-face, facial expressions, pace, and tone of what you're trying to communicate. And my concern with not only this generation, but the next, is that with all the texting and um, FaceTime or whatever the new technology is going to emerge, is that we don't learn how to communicate face to face. And not only that, we don't know how to communicate cross-culturally. So another point I'd like to make at this conference is, when you are at any conference or any gathering, do not party all you want with your friends afterwards. During the sessions, hang out with some people you don't know. Variety of reasons. They could be your colleague in the future. They could be the dean of the school that you want to become a professor at. You might need a collaborator in your research project and you'll have their name in the back of your mind or in my case, my memory is not that good so I write it down. I have an Excel spreadsheet. When I meet people, I think, oh, maybe I might do this with them or that with them. I put it down. I have a topic area. So when an idea comes up and I say, ooh, I would love to talk about how to network I think I'm going to call Dr. Chimba's office and find out if his students need that. Or I'd love to go to Tennessee so I can look up my topic and I have that information available to me. But that's just a little extra. Make sure that you go around and meet other people at the conferences. So we talked about what communication is. It's getting back to that. And I think the key thing here is on number three, a common system of symbols, signs, or behaviors. And guess what? Do we all have the same common system? Do we have the same symbols? Sometimes, I mean, generally speaking, you know what a stop sign is, whether the word stop is written across it, right? But there are common systems of behavior that we communicate with others, but if we're not in the same cultural background, it doesn't mean anything to us. For example, if there are two Asians walking towards each other, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Are are they going to acknowledge each other? No. no, they're not. If you walk across, and I'm, and I, like I said, I was grown in a different community. So if I see another Asian coming, and I say, hey, hi, their response is, do I know you? Or they don't say anything, and they put their head down, and they walk on. What happens, particularly with black males, if you're walking by somebody. They speak. They, they greet you. They usually give you some sign that, hey, I see you. <laughs> right? <laughs> and how about Chicanos, Mexicanos, que paso aquí? You do that as Luis says, you do the nose thing. <laughs> right? <laughs> And you walk by, but at least you know you've been acknowledged, right? (coughs) So those are some of the common (laughs) systems of symbols that they're not always the same. So what happens when you go into an interview and the person across from you doesn't look anything like you? We had just no idea. So the importance of some of the symbol signs and the pace and tone, because when I introduce myself to you, I usually speak relatively slowly, 
my name's Amy Mackey. I'm from Seattle, Washington. And I let it go at that. Now, if you're from Puerto Rico, they like to talk really fast. And if I didn't speak Spanish, I would never know what your name was. So remember when you're entering, introducing yourself, change your pace, slow it down, enunciate, so that people can remember who you are. Some of the terminology that we're talking about right now, but I'm giving you words to describe it and the importance of who you're talking to, what you're trying to say. So it's important to know who your audience is. I knew you were students. I knew you were engineering students. I made some assumptions that you might be very concrete, sequential. So I gave you an outline. I'm trying to follow the outline. I am not an engineer, and I'm not so linear. So sometimes we digress. I will try not to do that too often. You have to listen to the question. So in the interview, whether it's your graduate school interview or any other interview or you're re responding to a request by a professor, listen to what they're asking or what they're saying. If you do not understand, if you're Asian, what do you do? This is a generality, mind you. But if you, particularly of international Asians, Chinese, Japanese, if you don't understand, the tradition is nod. You just nod, or mm -hmm. do you do you understand? You haven't a clue, and the reason there is because. You're trying to protect your honor, right? I should know this, but I don't. He's my boss. He's my supervisor. I can't let him know I don't know. That's not the way to communicate. And also, if you don't understand, how are you going to produce something that they want? So if you listen, you don't understand. Are you going to say, hey, man, I don't get it? Or is it the body language, like, kind of thing? So how are you going to address that, that you didn't understand? What kind of tone are you going to use? What pace are you, what pitch can I really, I don't get it, kind of thing? Or are we going to say, could you repeat that question? I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand. Or are we going to say, I don't get it. I don't, what, what did you say? I don't, um, 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 you know, the pace. Take it slow. Be articulate. Keep your tone down. Don't raise your pitch. Because it, to me, when you raise your pitch and you're really Squeaky, and I don't know what is going on. It's like, holy crap, this person doesn't have a clue on what's going on. So, tone, pitch, pace, and also inflection. For example, I'm not sure I can <laughs> do the inflection part, but a lot of Foreign languages have different inflections. Have you ever been on a bus um, and, and tone um, with a group of Chinese international? Speak very loud and at a very high pitch. And you're thinking to yourself, are they all deaf? You know, but culturally that's the, the level that they are normally speaking at. So again... Remember who your audience is. Is it the dean? Because you're not going to go into a dean and ask for money, you know, in a squeaky, non-organized voice. And you have to listen. Body language, again, is very, very important. 
So even if you're nervous, some people, I have a grandson who's 19, if I could do it, I'd tie his foot down to the ground. Because all I see when I'm talking to him is this. You know, because he sits and he twitches his leg. And, and I know Bill Gates does that, but Bill Gates can afford to do that. <laughs> My 19-year-old grandson can't afford to do that because he's living with me. So body language, if you have a mannerism that you know might be distracting, I don't know if a lot of you meditate or, or have a moment of silence before you go into the meeting. Just try to relax. And if you have that particular twitch habit, try to control it because it will be distracting. It will be distracting. The other thing is eye contact when you, body language. And where you place your eyes. If you are not comfortable looking somebody in the eye, look kind of up this way. Now I look, I work for a dean, bless his little heart. He looks like this. And he talks and he, you know, and, and he's, it's okay for guys if I'm looking like this and you're talking to it. But if you're looking at women and you're going like this, I don't hear a thing you say. I'm thinking, why are you looking at my boobs? <laughs> and unfortunately, as much as I talked to him, <laughs> it was something that was embedded in his psyche, and he just couldn't do it. But I had a lot of women faculty coming in to me saying, what's with this guy? What the hell? And I, have to, and I had to explain. His body language was not, and not appropriate, but he was not, that's not what he was trying to convey. That was not the message. But still, it's very difficult to convince somebody that that's not what they were doing, right? So eye contact, very important. And the message. What's the message? And you heard yesterday, Dr. Chimba say, you know, the way you write. What did you write? What did, what did you mean to say? What did you say? And what does the other person understand you to say? Verbal same thing. When you're talking to someone... Think clearly what your message is. Word selection, very important. And say it clearly, okay? Written communication. Again, focusing on word choice, audience. If you're writing a letter to your grandmother or texting somebody, that's one thing. If you're writing a statement, to get into school, a totally different methodology of communicating. And I know that there's spell check on the computers. I know that there's grammar checks. I know that there's all types of programs that you can run your essays through to see if it's gr grammatically correct and if the spelling's correct. But what it doesn't do, it doesn't give you the tone by the words you use, the pace by the commas, semicolons, the colons you place. It's not going to give you all the answers. So what's the solution? If I can't rely on technology, what can I rely on? Peers. People. Peers. Teachers, writing centers. Do you have writing centers on campus? Yes. So I would make sure if you are doing your personal statement or even you're writing a letter to a prospective employer that you make sure that you check 
with your writing centers, have your peers read it. And also when you're doing a um, presentation, for example, there's nothing wrong with um, having a couple friends watch you make your presentation. It sounds a little scary and it's kind of odd, but there's nothing like your friends who are honest about how you look and what you're saying. I mean, that is friendship, right? You could say, I have a girlfriend that I walked out of the gym one day and I was all dressed in my suit and it was a light blue great and I had these new nylons on we used to wear nylons in those days by the way um, nylons on I said well how do I look and she goes well your legs look like you're dead and I went oh oh okay let me go to the student union and buy a new pair of nylons but that's what friendship is about so practice also practice in, in front of the mirror you know, they always tell you to put your affirmations near a mirror or somewhere where every morning you look into. But, but practice. And even when I do presentations like this, like the rest of the faculty, they're so polished, they don't, they're not nervous or anything. I'm nervous. So when I come up here, I also have to take a deep breath and lower my pitch because my pitch is very high when I'm nervous. And sometimes even when I answer the phone, you know, those wonderful robocalls and things you get, and I answer the they always ask for my mother. I said, I'm not only the mother, I'm the grandmother. And no, I don't want anything. No, I don't. I'm not that rude, but close. Yeah. Um, but I really have to bring it down a little bit, you know. So um, grammar and punctuation, word choice, remember who your audience is. And I hate to tell you this, writing is rewriting. So when you do your undergraduate capstone project, if you have it, you're going to write it. It's going to be reviewed. And guess what's going to happen? You've got to rewrite part of it, don't you? So just don't be discouraged. You just have to keep remembering that writing is rewriting. So here's a scenario. And I'm going to read it, and then you're going to tell me what's, what's really happening. Close your eyes. Don't read the thing. Close your eyes. Okay. You see a cashier smile at you as you wait in the checkout line. You stop your texting, and you smile back as the woman in front of you says no to the stomp, foot-stomping child whose hand she tugs. Noticing the commotion, the two deaf people signing to one another turn around. Okay, open your eyes. What, what, what type of communication was going on there? I'm sorry? Nonverbal. Nonverbal, the cashier smiles, you smile back. That's saying, hey, I see you. And you, as a client, are saying, yeah, thanks, I, thanks, I got it. Okay, what's happening with the woman? She's yelling, She's yelling at who? The and is a child really misbehaving or just kind of, eh? Just being a normal child. Just being a normal child. Mm. Okay. <laughs> he... That's true. It is being a normal child. It's the intensity of how normal you want to put up with. So, so the other is, there also is a sense, is there not, if somebody's walking behind you, could you kind of, you know, kind of turn around and look at, oh yeah, there's somebody there. Deaf people have a sense as well. And we have that sense of something, something's going on. So sometimes where we're in a meeting or we're talking to somebody and we're saying things and you go, something's, you know, something's off a little here. I feel something. Um, are you okay? Or, you know, is that what you really mean to say? So you, you know that there's intuition maybe, whatever you want to call it, but you have a sense. So that's what happened. Okay, what if I read it like this now that you all had the scenario? You see a cashier smile at you as you're waiting in the check line. You stop your texting and smile as a woman in front of you says, 
no to the foot stomping child whose hand she tugs. Noticing the commotion, the two deaf people signing, um, signing to one another turn around. So how, how upset is the mother there? She's just fine. Not, not too upset. You know, whatever the child's doing, stomping around, you know, that's fine. She's not too upset. So did you notice the tone, the difference, what it was communicating? Yes. Yes, no? Hello, wake up. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh -huh. The fact that it's capitalized and in quotation marks kind of makes it seem like she's yelling, though. So it's not yeah, that's why I had I wanted you to close your eyes because it's usual because that's and that's very good because when you're writing, when you're writing, if you capitalize, what happens when you capitalize in texting I'm and and yelling. Yelling. Is he doing sign <laughs> reading the loud voice? That is really annoying by the way, <laughs> unless you're really angry at somebody. But that's another thing to keep in mind when you're texting and you're writing emails. One, they never go away. I know you think when you hit delete, they go away. They don't. So be very careful on how you communicate, not only to one another, but to, you know, your professors. So... Um, I'm going to have you do an exercise, but this is the writing part of it. Just to give you an example, so you get to read this one. So do you see what happens when commas are not used correctly? <laughs> and there are many examples, like in, in legal profession, those commas can be deadly. So punctuation in writing is key. And similar is the word choice that we talked about to talk about tone. Remember yesterday, I don't know about the rest of you, when he was talking about the GRE, and he put that list of vocabulary words up, and you had to fill them in. I'm looking at them going, thank God I don't have to take the GRE. <laughs> I, I mean, there are a lot of words to choose from. And you have to be very selective and make sure the context of the sentence you're writing, the words are appropriate. Okay? So to make it applicable to what we're trying to do here, when you're writing for grad school for your personal statement or you're taking your interview, these are the questions that a lot of the speakers have already gone over, correct? So why are you going to grad school? Not, and please don't say because it's free. You know, it's, you know I know it is, but that's, that, that's not quite... <laughs> Dr. Blevin says, we'll go for free. <laughs> and um, you want to include in, in your statement you know, within my discipline, what interests me. So if you're a civil engineering, what in civil engineering specifically are you interested in? Because you're not applying to not only the department, but a specific area of the department. And why this institution? And I was a director of admissions, so what I'm saying is not made up. I don't want to know that you love the Seahawks and the Huskies, and that's why you're coming to the University of Washington if you're majoring in, in a STEM field. You might say something that you enjoy the student life. That's appropriate in general, but we want to know specifically why you chose this institution and why are you qualified? Why should I even look at your app? Why should I take time to interview you? Mention your strengths and weaknesses that were said. And we don't want to overemphasize, but also your willingness to, okay, I might not be as good at writing, but I'm interested in proving that by doing, taking 
a, a writing course or whatever your weakness is. Okay. And what do you bring to them program? Not only do I want to know that you're bringing enthusiasm, interest, but I want to know that you're bringing some sort of expertise. That what you're going to be doing is meaningful to mankind. Well, how is it going to impact mankind and the department in particular? Um, and what do, what do you plan to do after graduation? I will say to you, <laughs> this is sort of inside information, but we're, we have a real shortage of faculty members, particularly faculty members homegrown of color. So if one of your things is I'm not saying you have to lie about this, but in the future, if there's a possibility that you might want to be a professor, you need to let them know. Because we're looking for professors. Um, and that goes with number eight, your career consideration. And what personal values will guide my decisions in coming here? What are, what are your values? What, What's your integrity that you bring to the program? Are you a hard worker? Do you get up on time? These are not the words you want to use, but these are the ideas. So I have organizational skills. I, I'm a great time manager. I can move through the program because I have these skills. Because not only, not only do they want you, they want you to graduate in a timely fashion. And do you have a plan? Those who fail to plan, plan to fail. So do I have a plan? These are some of the things that you want to have answered in your head. So when you go to the interview, you have the language. You have a plan that you can, and also you can write about it. Okay. So, in-person interviews. We talked about these things. Body language, posture, manner, and mannerisms. We didn't mention uh, proximity. How close do you get when you're talking to somebody? Somebody, somebody want to volunteer? Because I hate to call on you and make you feel bad. Okay, come on up. Whoa, I forgot about this part of uh, <laughs> has to stay with me. So this is, I teach a course in networking. So if I, this is my first introduction to him. Why don't you start out? How are you doing? Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good. My name is Axel. Axel? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and what's your last name? Ranga. Ranga. <laughs> okay, I feel pretty good. You know, that's not too bad. What happens if I do this, Ranga? <laughs> Axel, I just a little close, huh? It's like, whoa, wait a minute here, lady. I didn't want to get to know you that well. <laughs> okay, thanks. The other thing is, he has a very quiet voice. And I was relatively close, and that's fine. His name is also different, but he said it at a pace that I could get. All I want, to know, want you to be aware of is that who's your audience, and you might have to bring it up a little bit. Sometimes if you feel comfortable, you can stand up. You know. And the other thing is when you're in a group like this, like I said, mix. And that'll give you the more mix you get in the people that you get introduced to, the more practice you'll have and the easier it'll get, right? So um, practice, practice, practice. And I am going to give you just the students, because I only brought 40. I didn't 
think about faculty, but I'll be happy to send faculty one. Um, years ago, I wrote a, a guide for going to conferences. So one of the things that it's in there is that you need to make sure that um, you sit with other people, you introduce yourself. How many of you have business cards? Okay, you should all have business cards, every one of you. Because when you go to conferences and I hand you my card and you're going to want something from me, like for example, I want, would you review my uh, personal statement? If I have your card, I can remember, okay, I remember who he was, where I met him, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what do you put on the card? There's an example in there. You just name, perspective date of graduation, major, university, email, um, something that a person can take away. I realize that nowadays with the phones, you also can just phone to phone transfer cards. And that's great for some people. I'm still old fashioned. And a lot of people don't have that technology on their phone. So you should carry a business card. Okay. So we went over all these things. Are there any questions about this? He's smiling. You two are smiling. You got something going on and I don't know what it is. But I am going to find out afterwards. See what body language can do and what you can learn? <laughs> You can learn so much. <laughs> so much. Okay. So here's um, some of the barriers to verbal communication. And just listen, not listening, you know, using acronyms. Yesterday when I was introducing the speaker, there were more acronyms on that thing, so I had to translate them. So when I introduced her, I wasn't saying the TBR and the TCD, and everybody was going, yeah, that's really yeah, informative. So I was trying to translate. So a lot of that, don't use those types of things in not only verbal communication. You can say them, but then you need to make sure you define it. Rambling responses. If I ask you a question answer the question, but especially in the um, graduate interview, because they're going to be listening. We listen to a lot of people. And we read a lot of statements, and they begin, ah, pretty soon it's like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so you do have to make, um, respond to the point, no rambling, okay? Grammatical errors are very disconcerning, especially when you're talking. Like in Hawaii, we go, oh yeah, whatever, whatever, you know, and then if you say that in a meeting, they're going to go, Whoa. what, where's that from? <laughs> or you can say it like my seven-year-old granddaughter does, it's time for dinner, go wash your hands and come back. Whatever. It's like, excuse me? And then we have to redo it. But it's that, again, tone, pitch, attitude. Um, so make sure gram grammatical errors, again, tone, body language, eye contact, slouching. Um, s I don't know how many of you are pointers. I'm only do that with my grandkids, you know, but... I try not to, but it's really hard when they're rolling around on the floor. Whoa! I don't like this thing. I don't have a pocket either. But when you, when you point at people, it's very almost offensive. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of like, do you, do you understand? Or can I help you with something? Or, you know, just remember, and if you are a finger pointer and a whip, maybe you can clasp your hands together. But gently, not like sitting at the table like this. You know, like you're like you're really nervous. Okay. Remember. Oh, I got the whole thing. Remember um, to listen. Be concise. Proximity, volume. All those things that we talked about. Okay.
pencil and paper, everyone. So, the faculty, when they interview you, or they look at your records, they can see that you've got an A or a B or a two point whatever. So they already know academically where you stand. What they want to know is what do you bring to what do you bring to the department? If you're going to go into graduate school, you have to have good time management skills, you have to be organized. So they want to hear those things. And this is a this bottom thing using a short guide by writing. If you look up this um, individual, there's a one sheet, and, and I don't hand them out because every school is different. And even though it says, you know, talk a little bit about yourself, what your major is, expand on this, what you want to do is, this is like applying for a job, research the institution and what do they ask about on their web page what do they tell you about their students what do they tell you about what they expect from the students so look at the school and this is work because you're going to apply to more than one graduate school at least at a minimum three and i'm sure dr um Vasquez is also telling about um, you have to save money to apply for these, except graduate school is free. So you should be able to get a waiver. So let's just take a few minutes and go ahead and start. I'm going to um, go back to this. So with those things in mind, just get started on why, why I, as an admission director, want to spend time reading your personal statement and consider you for graduate school at wherever. I am just going to stop you for a minute, go over some of the barriers, and I think they're pretty evident from what we've talked about. Preparation, 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 focus. Who's the audience, grammatical, all these things, both verbal and written. And so this is what, oops, there's a pair. Oh, is that us over there? <laughs> That's a scary thought. So make sure you understand what is being asked. Think through the response. Respond to the specific request directly and concisely. Practice, practice, practice.